Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming. Tonight's class uh, will be on um, a very famous prayer that we say, the Shema Yisrael. Uh, translates as, Hear, O Israel. According to the Rambam, the only prayer that we say uh, when we, in our prayers is the, that is Torahic, that is from the Torah, is the Shema Yisrael. The first six words in the first paragraph, Yahafta, are found in the book of Devarim in the portion of Voes Hanan, chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. There is a medrash in Bereshish Rabbah that states, based on the first verse in the book of Bereshit in the portion of Ayachi, that Yaakov, our father, on his deathbed, wanted to reveal to his sons the time of the final redemption. However, before he could do so, the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, left him, and he was not able to be able to do so. So he thought that the reason for the loss of the Shekhinah may have been that one or more of his children did not have a true belief in the sovereignty of the one and only God. And so they said to him, Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel, referring to their father Yaakov, that was his second name that was given to him by God, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, the same God that you worship is our God, and he is the only God in existence. He replied to their words with the verse, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchutol the Olam Boed, Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever, which is not found in the verse, and so we have a tradition to say it quietly. The Shema occupies, pardon me, the Shema accompanies us from birth and guides us through our lives until the last moment of life. The night before a circumcision, there was a custom to bring young children to the crib of the infant that was to be circumcised, where they recite the first chapter of the Shema. As the Talmud and Brachos 5a states that the Shema serves as a protection against harmful spirits. Now, the first law in the Mishnah, which was the first writing of the oral tradition, is the question about the proper time for the recitation of the evening Shema. It states, May Alma Ematai Koronet HaShema, from when may we fulfill our obligation to recite the Shema? This is relevant to our topic since when a young Jewish boy enters into manhood, the first mitzvah, the first commandment that he is obligated to observe is the saying of the evening Shema. As we see, the Shema accompanies us throughout our lives. Now, we end our prayers on Yom Kippur with the words of the Shema. The Shalah HaKadosh, one of the commentaries, said that when saying the Shema, one should have in mind that he, is, he would willingly give up his life for Kiddush Hashem, which is sanctification of the name of God. We have a belief, Makshava Kemaseh, that a God considers a good deed, pardon me, a good thought, like an actual deed. So by just contemplating on giving your life for God, it is considered as if one actually has done so. Now the Talmud in Brachos 5a states that if a person is being overwhelmed by his evil inclination, what should he do? So first it says study Torah. If that doesn't work, then he should say the Shema. And if it still doesn't work, then let him visit a cemetery and think about his mortality. Again, the power of Shema to help a person in his struggle against the powers of evil. The Talmud in Sota 42a discusses the duties of the Kohen, the priest, who is designated as what's called the Meshuach Milchama, the anointed for war. He would accompany the army to the battlefield, and there, he would encourage them with words from the Torah amongst them was the words of the Shema. The Talmud asked the question, why does the Kohen preface his, ad his address with the words Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel in particular? Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi that the Holy One blessed be he is saying to Israel, even if you have not fulfilled any mitzvah, any mitzvah other than the recitation of the Shema, morning and evening, you will not be delivered into the hands of your enemy. The power of Shema to protect and secure victory for the Jewish army in battle. 
In ancient times, there existed in the land of Israel six cities of refuge. If someone killed another person, the victim's relatives, referred to as the Goel Hadam, the avenger of the blood, were actually permitted to avenge the death of their relative and kill the accused for his act, unless the accused reached the city of refuge. There, he was safe. He was then taken out and judged by the court to ascertain his innocence or guilt. The question is asked, where is the city of refuge today? And the sages tell us, the six words of the Shema represent the city of refuge, a sanctuary for anyone who is experiencing difficulties in life. The Talmud in Brachot 61b tells us the story of the ten martyrs who were tortured by the Romans. One of those martyrs was Rabbi Akiva. The Talmud states that when the Romans took him out to face his execution, it was the time for reciting the Shema. And as they were combing his flesh with iron combs, Rabbi Akiva was reciting the words of the prayer and accepting upon himself the yoke of the heavenly kingdom. His students, who were in attendance, saw and heard him recite the words with great joy and concentration. And they asked him, Ad Khan, how is it possible that you have the presence of mind to concentrate on the Shema as you're being tortured so horribly? Then he responded, all my life, whenever I recited the Shema, I pictured myself being tortured to death for the sanctification of God's name. I have prepared myself for this scenario for many years. Should I not feel great joy that now I am able to not only serve God in life, but also in death? Rabbi Kiva was so perfectly attached to the divine, to the Shekhinah, that his soul was elevated above all bodily trappings, and he was able to transcend his physical pain. Again, the power of Shema, even in death. We are told by our sages that when Adam, first man, ate from the tree of knowledge, he tainted four out of the five of our five senses. He saw that the fruit looked appealing, sight. She gave him the fruit and he took it, touch. He listened to his wife, sound or hearing, and he ate from the fruit, taste. The one thing that Torah does not describe him doing is smelling the fruit. So the sense of smell has remained pristine. This is one of the reasons that the Zohar states that Kedusha, holiness, enters a person through his nostrils. As the verse says in the book of Bereshit, in the first portion of the Torah, Vayipok biapov ruach And he, God Almighty, blew into his nostrils, Adam, the breath of life. This is also why a sacrifice is referred to as a reach nichoach, a sweet savor to God. When we say the first line of Shema, we offer these four tainted senses to God as an atonement. The word Shema means listen, sense of hearing, that connects to one's ears. In order to hear, something, something must be said, speech, connected to the sense of taste, your mouth. The third letter in the word Shema is a large ayin. The word ayin in Hebrew means eye, sight. And when we say the first verse, we cover our eyes with our hand. The word Shema, Shin, Mem, Ayin, have a lowercase value, gematria, of 3 plus 4 plus 7, 14. The gematria of the word Yad, hand, touch. So by saying the Shema, we use our four tainted senses in a positive way to atone for the negative way that Adam had used them. In the book of Bereshit, in the portion of Vayigash 46.29, the Torah recounts the emotional meaning of Yaakov, our father, and his beloved son, Yosef. They had not seen each other for 22 years. Yaakov thought that Yosef was dead. He never really expected to ever see him again. Yosef was so excited that he would finally see his beloved elderly father that he, the viceroy of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world, harnessed the horses to his chariot himself. 
When he finally met his father, as you can imagine, it was very emotional. Yosef hugged his father and he sobbed. Strangely enough, Yaakov did not cry, nor did he kiss Yosef. But why? And Rashi tells us, because he was reciting the Shema at that very moment. Strange. So according to Lakuti Yehuda, Yaakov was old and weak. He was afraid that the excitement of the moment would bring about his death. But he was happy to die, accepting the yoke of heaven. So we have an illusion from here that a person who is dying should recite the Shema before his soul expires. When looking at the six words of the Shema, one notices that the ayin, the last letter of the first word Shema, and the Dalit, the last letter of the last word Echod, are both large. I have already mentioned that the letter ayin alludes to an eye, and the word Shema means to hear. Is serving God just about hearing? No. The word alludes to the idea of comprehension. Not just to hear, but to be able to understand, to know. Because we know that the eyes are the windows of the soul. So the large eye alludes to seeing with your mind's eye, the soul. The only part of your body that recoils when any object tries to touch it, anything physical, is your eye. The eye is connected to the spiritual realm, more so than the physical. Now the last word in the Shema is the word Echad, which means one. The last letter in the word is a Dalid, which is again, as I mentioned, large. When we say the words of this verse, we draw out and accentuate the last letter, Dalid, Echad, and we draw it out. Because there is a concern that one might mistakenly see the Dalid as a Resh, since their shapes are very similar, and pronounce the word Acher, which means other, instead of the word echad, meaning one. The meaning of the verse would change drastically. So instead of testifying about God's oneness with the word acher, we would be describing him as a God amongst other gods. When we join these two letters together, the, the, the uh, ayin and the dalit, it spells the word aid. Aid is, means witness. And dalit ayin, the, when you move it, the, uh, you change the direction. It spells the word da, to know. So by saying the Shema, we testify there that there is only one God in the world, and he is our God. In addition, it is our mission in this world to try da, to know and see God in anything and in everything that we do. Albert Einstein said, Coincidence, coincidences are God's way of staying Anonymous. In Pirkei Avot, Rebbe Lazar Akapar states, 4.22, Hu ha'ed, which means God, he is the witness. We have a belief that the only one who knows your thoughts is God Almighty himself. Not even angels are privy to this. They do not have that ability. So it is only he, God, who can testify about your thoughts when you say the Shema and thereby, thereby swear allegiance to his sovereignty. The Zohar states that if you take the large ayin from the word Shema and the large Dalit from the word Echod, the remaining letters spelled the word Esmach, I will rejoice. The only way we can serve God properly is through joy. As it states in Tehillim, Psalm 100, Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha. Serve God with joy. There is another allusion to the word Shema here in the large I and I. At the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, the Jewish nation were able to hear Shema and see I and the words of God that he spoke simultaneously. In fact, the Medrash states that they were able to see that which was usually heard and hear that which is usually seen. A totally miraculous experience. The word Shema is an acronym for three different concepts that one should concentrate on when saying these, this word. Number one, looking at the letters in order, Shin, Mem, and Ayin allude to the verse in Yeshaya 40.26 which states, Su'u Lift your eyes on high. 
And secondly, if you take the same letters backwards, then it would be I and Mem Shin, stand for O Malchut Shemayim, to accept the yoke of heaven. Before reciting the Shema, I want you to cover their eyes and think that I want to fulfill the positive commandment to say the Shema. That I am willing to give my life. I'll be Kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's name. That I lift my eyes on high and that I accept upon myself O Malchut Shemayim, the yoke of heaven. With our hands over our eyes, we begin the words, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. And whenever we pray to God, we do so as part of the national body of Israel. Therefore, most of our prayers are recited in the plural. We ask all of our Jewish brethren to join us in our declaration that God is our God and that he is the only one. The word Shema is an acronym for Shin, Shacharit, the morning prayer, Mem, Mincha, the afternoon prayer, and Ayin, Arvis, the evening prayer. Three times a day, we turn to our God for strength and guidance, our private, private audience with our Father in heaven. We acknowledge that he is Hashem Elokeinu, the Lord our God. These two names of God symbolize God in his capacity of mercy, Hashem, and his capacity of judgment, Elokeinu. And whichever way he interacts with us, it's always important to remember, it's always with love. It's interesting to note that out of the six words in the verse, three are God's name. The fact that the name of God of judgment, Elokeinu, is bordered on both sides by God's name of mercy, the Yudke Vavke Hashem, it's not an accident. When we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, we always begin and end with a tekiah, a straight blast, which symbolizes chesed, mercy and kindness. The middle blast, shvarim or trua, allude to din, severity and judgment. This tells us that God is a benevolent father. So in the beginning and in the end, he always treats us with mercy and kindness even though there are times in the middle where he disciplines, disciplines us with tough love. And so too here with the Shema. We acknowledge that though God may at times reprimand us with strict discipline, at its core it is always predicated on love and kindness. Rabbeinu Bachai states that the reason the Torah uses God's name three times in the Shema is A, to say that there is only one God who deserves this name, B, that he is the God of the children of Israel. And C, that he is one and unique in the universe. And there is no other God who deserves this title. The Devorim Rabbah states that the reason the statement of our faith begins with the Shema is because when we stood at Mount Sinai, we said the words Nasev and Nishma, which mean we will do and we will listen. However, by making the Evgel Hazav, the golden calf, we negated the nasa, the doing part of our commitment, and all that remained was the nishma, the hearing part of our commitment. And so we begin the prayer with Shema, here. We conclude our recitation of the Shema with the word echod, one. We draw out the last letter, the dalid, so as to emphasize, again, the word echod, and not the word acher, other, with the resh. The word echad is made up of three letters, and they have great significance. The Aleph, which has a numerical value of one, alludes to the fact that he is the one and only God. The Chet has a numerical value of eight, alluding to the seven heavens and one earth. And the Dalad, numerical value of four, allude to the four directions of the compass. The Shulchan Aruch states that when staying, saying the word echad, that one should have these thoughts in mind. In addition, when saying these words, one should move his head up seven heavens, down one earth, and then in all four directions, an illusion that he is the master of everything in this world and the world above. And with the recitation of the words of the Shema, may God reward us with the bringing of Mashiach Sinkenu quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a great Shabbos.